Now it is my privilege to introduce you to Dr. Robert E. Johnson, Chancellor of the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth. Dr. Johnson began his leadership at UMass on July 1, 2017, the same day that I joined BCC, and for that we will always have a very special bond. With an un unyielding belief that higher education is a public good, Dr. Johnson has dedicated his career to building higher education opportunities for people. He consistently stresses in words and deeds that the three pillars of global citizenship, academic excellence, social responsibility, and creative expression are prerequisites for success in a complex and hyper-connected world. He previously served as president of Becker College in Worcester, Massachusetts. He's a native of Detroit, Michigan, and Dr. Johnson holds a PhD in Higher Education Administration from Toro University International, a master's degree in Education Administration from the University of Cincinnati, and a bachelor's degree in Economics from Morehouse College. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert E. Johnson. Good morning, everyone. Let me try that again. Good morning, everyone. It's so exciting to be here uh, to celebrate the life and legacy of the late, great Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Dr. Laura Douglas and the Bristol Community College family for hosting this event. Give them a big round of applause. Ultimately, we're here because of young people to make sure that they not only understand the history, but also to make sure that we serve as role models uh, for them to understand what they should do, how they should do it, and a way forward. Uh, we have a group of young people here from the Youth Civic Leadership Institute. Uh, to my left, they have on the, uh, the, the uh, bright t-shirts back there. 15 UMass Dartmouth students, 20 area high school students. Give them a big round of applause, service, leadership. I also uh, want to recognize um, our uh, delegation, Senator Mike Rodericks, uh, Representative uh, Sylvia uh, Fiola, and Schmid. Please give them a big hand. Now, now, this is the delegation that works with both UMass Dartmouth and Bristol Community College to make sure that we have the resources that are necessary to wor run world-class institutions. Let's give them a big hand. <laughs> And um, I also want to um, recognize the chair of the board, Joan Medeiros. Um, I, I really uh, met her uh, several months ago, uh, but she is also a UMass Dartmouth alum. Please give Joan a big hand. And of course, the illustrious mayor from Fall River, Mayor Career. Good, good, good to see you. It is a joy and a pleasure to be here today uh, for this great celebration. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming out on such a cold and brisk day, uh, our community and civic leaders for their continued quest to promote social justice. Uh, I would also like to thank my UMass Dartmouth family for its support during my transition to my new position. All employees or alums of UMass Dartmouth, please Stand. Please stand. There. Give them a hand. Applause 
We are proud of the fact that at UMass Dartmouth, we provide a private college educational experience and a public university value. You know, I would be remiss if I did not recognize the reason I have any, I've had any element of success in my career and in my life. Uh, she is my rock, she is my bridge over troubled waters. My wife, Michelle Jones Johnson, who serves as the Vice President of Talent and Inclusion at Worcester Polytech and is a bona fide thought leader in the future of work and organizational development, Michelle Jones Johnson. So Mike Roberts just looked at me and said, you better get that right. <laughs> I would also like to congratulate uh, our honoree today, Clayton Timas, as the Distinguished African American Alumnus of the Year. To, Laura Doug to Dr. Laura Douglas, friends, and to all of the foot soldiers of the Civil Rights Movement, past, present, and future, thank you for allowing me to spend just a few moments on this great day to talk about the life and legacy of the great late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Massachusetts has always been and continues to be a beacon of hope and justice. Uh, Massachusetts is the birthplace of Crispus Attucks and W.E.B. Du Bois. So it, it is fitting that we celebrate this day standing on the shoulders of those who have come before us, those African Americans who built a rich legacy, made history, and made a difference in the community and in the world. The 54th Massachusetts Infantry, which was one of the first African American regiments in the Civil War. Phyllis Wheatley, who was America's first African American poet. Uh, we are here today. Why are we here today? We all have come here today to celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I did not know Dr. King, but my Uncle Bob did. Uncle Bob was the associate publisher and executive editor of Jet Magazine for more than 45 years. He graduated from my alma mater, Morehouse College, with Dr. King in the class of 1948. Uh, Uncle Bob was my mentor, and I am his namesake. Uh, my thoughts today are informed in part by Uncle Bob's relationship with Dr. King and the stories that he used to tell me, and also my own relationship with Martin Luther King III, because he and I were classmates at Morehouse together as well, who I've come to know, and he is a dear friend. Uh, today, throughout the King Holiday celebration, across this nation and around the world, people, regardless of color or class, will gather in schools and churches, in synagogues and sanctuaries, in auditoriums and gymnasiums, on their jobs and in jails, in halls and in homes, to honor the life and work of the late, great Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Uh, there will be sermons and speeches. Uh, there will be marches and monuments and programs and proclamations. There will be testimonials and, and teach-ins. There will be praying and singing. And every event will be designed to rededicate Dr. King's dream. It is fitting that we gather today at an educational institution. One of the things that Dr. King believed was education as an empowerment tool. In 1947, at Morehouse College, Dr. King wrote in the Maroon Tiger, the student newspaper, that education has both a utilitarian and moral function. Think about that idea. Your education is wasted if it is only used to earn and not to serve. King argued and insisted that intelligence plus character, that is the global goal, that is the true goal of education. Now think about that idea. You cannot truly be educated without the development of both your intellect and your character, your brain and your soul. 
Uh, Dr. King knew the importance of studying. He knew that knowledge was power. He knew that a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Uh, therefore, early, therefore, early in Dr. King's uh, life, he decided to develop himself to the fullest through education. Young people, at the age of 15, he finished high school and went to Morehouse College. At 19, he finished college and started working on his master's degree. At 22, he finished his master's and started working on his PhD. And at 25, he finished his PhD and started pastoring at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. At the age of 26, he started the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And from that point, he better built a better world one individual empowered by education that developed both his intellect and character made a difference on this entire planet. Let me ask you today then, do we have the will as a community and as a nation to achieve the true goal of education? Intelligence plus character. Is it possible to ensure a vibrant and competitive education system in the age of Google, Twitter, and Facebook when, when, when massive amounts of information, some true, some false, uh, some false, some false? <laughs> I'm not going to get political, but I'm just saying. <laughs> As this information constantly echoes across the globe and too often entices us to consider only that which we are preconditioned to believe. More than 50 years after the March on Washington, what would Dr. King say about the state of education in our digital, hyper-connected, yet divided society? I know what my Uncle Bob used to tell me. He used to say, Dr. King is brilliant, Dr. King is determined, Dr. King has drive. He has this desire to make a difference in the world. I sum it up simply by putting it this way. Dr. King had the powerful combination of intellect and character, and most importantly, he had the will to win. Regardless of the fire hoses or the threats on his life, he had the will to win. No matter how many times he was put in jail, uh, he had the will to win. We talk about Dr. King's dream, but do we have a dream? Do we have the will to win in these uncertain times with false truths and false lies? What are we going to do in the present age? Do we have the will to win at education because we know providing quality education is a social and economic moral imperative? As our schools and colleges and universities go, so go our communities, our economy, our nation, and our democracy. We live in a world where our education system is struggling. Too many kids, 13 million, are going hungry. A one in five in food insecure homes. Uh, too many kids are dropping out. One in four students do not complete high school on time in this country. One in six 16 to 24 year olds have not completed high school. Uh, too many states are investing too little in education from uh, K to gray and the federal government that has done little to keep a college financially affordable and accessible. Uh, this has placed a burden on students and their families, increasing the average amount of student debt to over $37,000. Denying educational opportunity to young people has profound economic impact on individuals, on families, and communities. The Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that a high school dropout will earn about $26,000 a year. A high school graduate, $35,000. Bachelor's degree, I mean community college, 42,000. Bachelor's degree, 59,000. And if you have a master's degree, $70,000. You get the point. Education equals economic opportunity. Don't listen to what some are saying out in the news. Education is the great 
thing that provides social mobility in our lives. Meanwhile, the perspective developed through years of education is priceless. We cannot raise a generation of young people capable of keeping the dream alive unless we change the course of education in this country. Do we have the will to win? Do we have the character to stand up and do what is right? The truth is that somewhere, at some time, our nation stopped thinking about Stop thinking of education as a public good. We have stopped thinking of education as an investment in our collective well-being. And sometimes when that happens, we end up with a nation that is in disarray. Uh, the data is, cl is clear. The more education you have, the higher your income. The more education you have, the healthier you are. The more education you have, the less likely you are to commit a crime or be a victim of crime. The higher a community's uh, dropout rate is, the weaker its economy. The lower a community's education attainment, the lower its family income. Here in Fall River, civic leaders understanding the, that connection is important. Uh, your Chamber of Commerce and corporate citizens such as Nick Chris at Bay Coast Bank who has been an advocate and who has invested in education because he recognizes the economic benefit to the community. Give them all a big round of applause. And as we know from Dr. King's example that the education of one child has the potential to change our entire society. You see, education equals self-development. We need only look around this room to see how self-development has changed the lives of people. We need only survey the landscape of America to see how self-development has brought us a long way from 50 years to go. Uh, may it be the acute analytical ability of Alex Haley or the bad, bodacious brilliance of Benjamin Elijah Mays or the optimistic open-mindedness of Oprah Winfrey or the calm, courageous character of Coretta Scott King, we see that each and every one of them in their own way kept that dream alive. In the face of adversity, there are African Americans who stood up and moved forward in every walk of life. The road has been long, the struggle has been great, but we are living the dream because of the shoulders of those individuals who have come before us who decided not to give up and they confronted the times that they were in and they conquered injustice. Nothing will deter us from advancing, even though some might say we live in treacherous time. The disappearing civil discourse in our country, the alt-right movement, Charlottesville, the embracing and applauding of venomous tweets. Uh, it was the parliamentarian Edmund Burke who said the only thing necessary for triumph of evil is for good men and women to do nothing. Do we have the will to win, to stand up to the hypocrisy of some who are now leading this nation? Do we have the will to win to say when we see injustice, we won't look the other way. We will run towards it and make sure that justice evolves in this society, in every walk of life, for every citizen, no matter what. A society that is still grappling with the very basic principle of treating women with dignity and respect. We live in a society that will not pay a woman the same wage as a man who is doing the same job. You know, we should be excited that two women host the Today Show, but that excitement is tempered by the fact that neither of them earns 50% of the wage of the abusive man that Hoda replaced. There's something wrong with that. Do we have the will to win? Who will carry that torch? Every year around this time, there's a renewed dialogue about who are today's torch bearers. Who is the 21st century Martin Luther King Jr.? 
During the Civil Rights Movement, my Uncle Bob would sometimes travel with Dr. King to cover a story. The publisher, John H. Johnson, would always tell Uncle Bob that it was dangerous and he did not uh, have to go uh, to cover the story in Mississippi, Montgomery, uh, Birmingham, or, or Selma. Uncle Bob, as a dedicated journalist, would take that risk so that black America would be told the story of the struggle and of the movement. Uncle Bob went with Dr. King during the height of the Montgomery bus boycott. In August 1955, he went to Mississippi to cover the br brutal murder of Emmett Till. Uh, the story with the picture of Emmett Till appear appeared on the cover of Jet Magazine. It lit a fire in the soul and conscience of a country and energized the civil rights movement. As a country, we are not where we need to be, but thank God we are not where we used to be. Uh, we have come a mighty long way in the struggle. We are living and realizing the dream each and every day. We have realized that dream through self-development and ed in education, business, industry, government, and law. I contend that if everyone here today commits themselves to self-development, de then there will be plenty of people to pick up the torch to meet the needs of the present age. We cannot and should not uh, recreate the past. We can't boycott in Birmingham or sit in in Selma or march in Montgomery. We have to stand up with a moral conscience uh, underpinned by intellect and character to meet the needs of the present age. So uh, when there is a false tweet that goes out into cyberspace, don't be anti that tweet. Be pro something that is counter to that tweet. Mother Teresa said, I will never go to an anti-war movement, but I will go to a pro-peace movement. Uh, we witnessed uh, uh, this recently in the Alabama Senate race a few weeks ago. It, it should not go unnoticed that the alt-right preferred candidate and the candidate that was preferred by the President of the United States was winning all night. And then the last precincts in Alabama started to be counted in the county where Selma, Alabama is located. When Selma, Alabama's votes were counted, it was clear that the alt-right would lose and the man who prosecuted two Klan members responsible for the 1963 Birmingham church bombings that murdered four African-American girls would win. The arc of the universe bent a little more towards justice on that night. We cannot discuss the power and influence of Dr. King without noting his spirituality. As a Baptist minister, Dr. King always knew that God was on his side. And because of that, he knew the power of truth and love. He fought a good fight knowing that if he fought for the universal laws of justice, peace, and love, he would win the battle to perform, to reform earthly laws around civil rights and voting. So he fought the system, always knowing that uh, no jail cell could contain him. No biting dogs could intimidate him. No fire hoses would turn him. No explicit racism could discourage him. No hooded Klansman could frighten him. No bomb could distract him. No bullet could stop the arc of the universe from bending towards justice even once he was gone. Is there a place for a powerful spiritual awareness today or are we continue or, com or condemned to worship our devices. The present internet age talks about BG, which means before Google. If Dr. King were here today, I think he may have his own version of BG. He would probably say before God. He would be asking us when we stand before God, will we dedicate ourselves to keeping 
the dream alive? Will we teach black boys how to become strong black men? Will we help the homeless? Will we feed the hungry? Will we be a mother to the motherless and a father to the fatherless? And will we stand strong against the tsunami of injustice in the current face of adversity? Who is willing to take up the torch for a new generation of leadership? The 21st century has emerged and a new generation of leadership is emerging to meet the needs of the present age. All we have to do is look around us and we can see uh, the hope and the humility of Congressman uh, Joe Kennedy, the driven dedication drumbeat of Deval Patrick, the calm, courageous character of Charlie Baker, the marching, meaningful mission of Michelle Obama, the daunting, determined dignity of Donna Brazile, the serene, subtle strength of Spike Lee, and even the bright, brave brilliance of Barack Obama. A new generation of leadership has stepped forward, and if they stay focused on their own self-development and spiritual awareness, then the dream will be kept alive. My Uncle Bob used to always say, nephew, fly with the eagles and don't run with the turtles. He used to always say that the eagles are interesting birds. Uh, he said, you see, when a storm is approaching an area, the eagle has the ability with this huge wingspan to allow the updraft of the wind to lift it above the storm. The eagle does not fly through the storm, but above the storm. In our current state, it is only through such enlightenment that we can rise above the storms that are hitting our nation today. We must rise above the storm of petty politics. We must rise above the storm of home foreclosures and a do-nothing Congress. We must rise above the storm of gun violence on our streets, in our schools, and in our communities. We must rise above the storms of our soldiers dying in an endless war. Only through education that strengthens both our character and intellect and self-development that includes spiritual awareness can we hope to bring about social change. Our legacy, social change, or festering injustice. Our legacy 50 years from now will be either the social change we bring or the injustice we allow to fester. Dr. Kim King committed his life to social justice, literally. He used his talents to make the world a better place. He used his knowledge to challenge an unjust system. He used his charisma to motivate a people. He used his voice to spread hope throughout the world. He used his vision to see a world that ought to be. He used his power to seek justice at home and peace abroad. He used his gift that God had given him to build a better world. Dr. King could have chosen to live a comfortable life. He was pastoring a large church in Alabama. He could have taught a college, at a college or university or sought political office, but he did not choose a life of comfort or convenience. He chose a life of challenge and controversy. He chose to challenge the bus system in Montgomery. He chose to fight for voting rights in Selma. He chose to integrate Birmingham. He chose to march on Washington. He chose to speak out against the Vietnam War. He chose to march with the garbage workers in Memphis. What will we choose to fight for? What will we choose to fight for? When we see what's going on in this country, what will we choose to fight for? The opportunity for all Americans to have a decent job and a good education? A stop of the proliferation of guns in our schools? Investment of corporations in our co communities? 
capital for young entrepreneurs to start a business, an education system that teaches for life and not just for a living, it is on us to enliven, to excite, and engage a great generation of young people, not just willing, but also able to live the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. One of the goals of Jet Magazine and my Uncle Bob was to keep people aware of what was happening in the world to inspire positive change within the community. My Uncle Bob, along with Dr. King and countless others, advanced that mission by helping our nation to see others who were doing great and inspirational things in the world. It is on us now. It is our turn. It is our duty. Let us remember after the speeches and the proclamations, the songs and the sermons and the prayers today, that the struggles continue. Our elders did their best. Justice is not present. We must do the rest. Uh, somebody's homeless, there's work to be done. Somebody's hopeless, the victory can be won. Racism is rampant. We must fight while we can. Peace is still possible if we all lend a hand. Apartheid died. Can you hear that African drum? Our parents did their best. Now our time has come. Let us hold on to the same human spirit that enabled us to succeed against the odds so many times. The same human spirit that enabled us to rise from the valley of slavery to corporate CEOs. The same spirit that allowed our nation to rise up against the tyranny of terrorism. Uh, there are all kinds of human spirits. The spirit of the Boston Tea Party, the spirit of the Declaration of Independence, the spirit of Henry Ford who wanted to build a car that his employees could afford to buy, the spirit of Albert Einstein who won a Nobel Peace Prize in physics, the spirit of our soldiers who stormed the, shore, store, shore, stormed the shores against fascism. Uh, uh, yes, there are all kinds of human spirits uh, in the world, but I think we need to capture the human spirit of our ancestor, ancestors, the same human spirits, spirit that allowed a black man by the name of Cheops, he was the builder of the Great Pyramid, which stands 451 feet tall. It covers 13 acres of land, took over 2.5 million bricks to build it. Even today, with all of today's modern technology, we cannot determine how our ancestor actually built that pyramid. On this King holiday, let us recapture the human spirit that allowed George Washington Carver to, draw, to derive over 285 products uh, uh, from uh, a peanut and 118 products from a potato. Uh, on this King holiday, let us recapture our human spirit, the same spirit that allowed us to endure 450 years of slavery, go on to elect and to go on and elect the first African American president of the United States. The same human spirit that allows us to endure our children uh, being killed in Newtown, Connecticut. The Great Depression and the Great Recession, Vietnam, two world wars, and 9-11 and hurricanes in Texas and Puerto Rico. Let us continue to dream with the same human spirit that allowed us to discover the printing press, traffic light, and a baby carriage. The human spirit that allowed us to discover syrup, ironing board, sugar, and even Worcestershire sauce. Let us continue a dream and build on the wondrous works of W.E.B. Du Bois and the positive persuasive prose of Paul Lawrence Dunbar and the talented, tenacious truths of Thurgood Marshall and the strong sophistication of Soldier of Truth. Let us remember to keep the dream alive by remembering Martin Luther King was a great man. We should look to him and say, yes, I can. He had a dream and so should you. Why don't you stand and show the world what we can do? Uh, some people believe the dream is dead. We have to stand. Our young people 
need to be led. Things are not what they always seem. There's a young person out there who also has a dream. Let us all stand and join as a team to remember this great man who one night had a dream. Some called him doctor, some live his dream. Remember the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. We all can dream, oh yes we can. Don't, do not forget the full measure of this man. If we have faith and believe in God's will, just like Dr. King, our dreams will be fulfilled. So let us go forward and remember one thing, never ever forget the legacy of the late great Dr. Martin Luther King. Finally, I want to close in the spirit of my Uncle Bob, who wrote the cover story in Jet Magazine of Emmett Till's death. And I want to contextualize Emmett Till's death with what I recently heard someone in the public domain say about his accuser. As you know, in 1955, in the state of Mississippi, Carolyn Bryant, a white woman, accused a 14-year-old boy by the name of Emmett Till of whistling at her as she was walking down the street. Last year it was published and she admitted that she lied about Emmett Till and he never whistled at her. More than 60 years ago, she lied about what happened. Uh, she was the Jim Crow version of today's fake news. Emmett Till was dragged from his home and lynched from a tree. His mother insisted they have an open casket so that the world could see how her son was brutalized. Rosa Parks said the day she decided not to sit in the back of the bus, she thought of Emmett Till. You see, Emmett Till's death was the spark that lit a candle that caused the smoldering flame that ultimately ignited the civil rights movement. Carolyn Bryant's single action, her decision to lie, her decision to lie triggered a nation to rise and fight for a common cause that ultimately the arc of the universe bent towards justice. Had it not been for the civil rights movement and the arc towards justice, I would not be chancellor of UMass Dartmouth today. As we go our separate ways, and think about a leader who talks about fake news, women in deeply misogynistic ways, preferring immigrants from, from Norway over those from Haiti or Africa. I know we are all appalled and, and terrified by a leader who promotes hatred, racism, and xenophobia, who uses social media to promote himself at the expense of others. Now, there is no difference in what Carolyn Bryant stood for then and what a certain leader stands for today. Take, take the physical image of Emmett Till's brutalized body laying in that casket and let it inspire us today. Let us, rise up with a na let us rise up as a nation with the will to win and achieve the true goal of education, which is intelligence plus character. Let us rise up as a nation and as a community of learners and not let the modern day Carolyn Bryant triumph. Let us rise up with the will to win so that 50 years from now, history will say on January 15th, 2018, that that was the beginning of a new generation of leaders who bent the arc of the universe towards 
justice. Thank you.